Our scripture passage for today is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verses 32 through 36, and this is the Word of God for us, the people of God. I'll be reading from the King James Version, starting in verse 32. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he saith to his, his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy and saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible that the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we ask that as we go through these extremely important passages today, that you would illuminate them in our hearts, drawing us closer to you that we may serve and worship and glorify you in all that we say and do. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, today, uh, as we uh, begin the observance here of Holy Week, and in particular today is the observance of Palm Sunday and Jesus' triumphal entrance into Jerusalem, uh, we also uh, refer to this week sometimes as Passion Week. Passion Week in reference to the trials and the sufferings uh, and the events that Jesus went through in the days between Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday or Easter. On the one hand, it is pretty difficult uh, and hard to imagine how our Lord goes from being welcomed into the city on Sunday with such celebration and fanfare and cries of Hosanna Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. To be followed days later with death cries from perhaps even the same people on Friday of crucify him. And while it may be confusing or shocking to us, it wasn't for God the Father nor was it for Jesus, God the Son. Set aside, just for the moment, if you can, all the good, all the good that he did, all the lives that he touched in his brief three years of public ministry, supernatural miracles, like the physical healing that he brought to the royal official's son, the healing he brought to Peter's own mother-in-law, the Roman centurion's servant, the lepers, and the woman with the internal bleeding. Or the supernatural miracles he did within the physical world around us, feeding over 9,000 men and their families with just a few fish and a few loaves of bread, calming the very storms in the sky that frightened his disciples, walking on water, and then guiding even those same disciples to some of the largest and most improbable fish catches that they had ever seen, or, or perhaps the greatest miracle that he accomplished, bringing about some of the greatest joy that perhaps people like you and I could ever hope to experience, a miracle that he did not once, not twice, but three times, raising from the dead first the widow's son at Nain, Jairus' daughter in Capernaum, and finally Lazarus, the brother of Martha and Mary, just outside of Jerusalem in Bethany. And of course, that doesn't even begin to touch on the intangible good that he did, the hope that he brought to people who were down and in need of hope, and the light of truth and comfort that he brought to the people through his compassion, through his teaching, and through his preaching. But in all of his deeds and in all of his actions and all the words that he spoke, 
Jesus had a specific purpose for everything that he did. As he perfectly conformed to and obeyed the will of his Father. Last week we looked at several verses from Isaiah chapter 53. The last of the four songs or poems in Isaiah prophesying about the coming of the servant of the Lord. God's Messiah. In those verses we saw how this servant would be utterly despised and rejected by the people. How they would see him stricken and smitten by God, assuming that it was his guilt that he was so stricken. That he was receiving the judgment that he deserved, only to finally come to the realization that he was actually completely innocent. And because of their own sins, was taken upon himself their punishment. And that by doing so, they had the opportunity to be, to be declared righteous because of his righteousness. In that same chapter, Isaiah 53, verse 10, we have God's own explanation of what his servant was doing and why. When Isaiah writes the following, Yet, it was the will of the Lord, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. This Messiah, this suffering servant, by suffering this grief and becoming a guilt offering and being crushed, he would be carrying out, carrying out the very will of God. He would also then prolong his days, a reference to the resurrection, whereby he would also see his offspring, those who are saved by his sacrifice, this too being the very will of God and the very means by which God's will would be accomplished. And so Jesus, that suffering servant that, that uh, Isaiah prophesied about, he knew that his mission, his purpose, his reason for being incarnate was always about one thing, one hour, one destiny, to fulfill the will of the Father, even to the point of being crucified on a cross, of which he had told his disciples on several occasions. But like Isaiah's readers and those that even heard him in person, they did not understand what this meant. And so here in our sermon passage for today that comes from the 14th chapter of the book of Mark, we find that Jesus' hour has finally come. There will be no further delays, no, for, no further warnings. Jesus and his disciples have just celebrated the Passover meal in the upper room where Judas has been revealed as the one who will betray Jesus and has already gone off to do so. During the meal, Jesus has instituted the sacrament of communion, which he commands us to do in remembrance of him as the perfect sacrificial Passover lamb. After they leave the upper room, Jesus goes on to inform them that they will all fall away and abandon him. To which Peter valiantly professes emphatically that he will not to which Jesus then tells him that, yes, he will. As a matter of fact, he will deny him three times that very night before the rooster crows twice. Which again, Peter rejects, saying that, no, Lord, I would die first before denying you. Of which the other disciples echo the same. Mark, who is actually John Mark and a cousin of Barnabas, a missionary companion of Paul and a disciple and follower of Peter, writes then in verse 32. And they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. Now, Mark had previously written that they had gone out to the Mount of Olives from the upper room. And John writes in his gospel that they went across a small brook in the Kidron Valley there on the Mount of Olives to a garden. Only Matthew and Mark actually name this garden a place called Gethsemane. 
When they arrive, this is all of the 11 disciples because Judas is gone and Jesus, he tells them to sit here while he prays. Mark goes on to write in verse 33, And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. As you are all well aware, I'm sure by this point, Jesus' inner circle consisted of the two brothers, James and John, along with Peter. These three men alone of the twelve were frequently called upon by Jesus to accompany him and to witness things that the others did not, including Jesus' transfiguration and when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. Jesus is again at this time choosing for them to be witnesses, this time to something they probably never expected in any way whatsoever. Now note, note how Mark records that Jesus began to be greatly distressed and troubled. Now to say this is highly unusual and abnormal for Jesus would be an understatement. To see him this upset, this worried, this troubled would go against everything, everything that they had experienced with him before. After all, this was the very same man who commanded the storm to stop, and it did. While they undoubtedly don't understand what was troubling him so greatly, especially since there was no one around them at the moment to cause him to be so distressed, they saw firsthand that something extraordinary was indeed happening to him. In his distress, Mark tells us in verse 34 that Jesus speaks then to these three. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. Now the three disciples with Jesus had no doubt that something is extremely abnormal. Never before had they seen or heard him so visibly troubled. Although he had told them over and over again what was coming, they still didn't understand, and now they were undoubtedly troubled as well. He tells these three to wait where they are and to watch. But to watch for what? Now some think that Jesus was asking them to be on the lookout for Judas and his return. Perhaps, but that is what may be more likely, is that Jesus just wanted them to be close to him for comfort and to witness what was about to happen, what he was about to do which Mark writes about again in verse 35. And going a little further, farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. From where he told the three to stay and watch, Jesus goes a little farther, falls on the ground and prays. Now Jesus praying was not anything new either to Jesus or to the disciples seeing him pray. But this, this was a lot different. The man that they knew, the Lord that they had followed, never before had they seen him like this. And even though he had mentioned to them time and time again about his hour coming, he had always told them previously that it was not the right time. But now, right in front of their eyes, they see the agony that he is going through revealed in his physical being, in his actions, as well as in his words. The very hour that Jesus had told them about over and over again, Jesus is now praying that if it were possible, that this hour might pass from him. Verse 36 gives us perhaps a little more detail on exactly what Jesus is praying and following that prayer up with, as witnessed by Peter, who's there, and later recorded by Mark here as he writes. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Now the first thing we should note here in verse 36 is the intense and intimate personal relationship that Jesus has with the Father as he refers to him in Aramaic as Abba, which is an intimate version of Father or daddy. Referring to God as his daddy shows the closeness that the two of them shared. Now the Greek version of father, pater, immediately follows Abba in this verse, and it is debatable as to whether or not Jesus actually said it or if Mark added it, but it matters not because Abba adequately demonstrates the intimacy in which Jesus is referring to God as his father. Father. 
Jesus goes on then to rightfully indicate that all things are possible for his Abba, for his daddy, and that there is nothing that he cannot do. Now, I won't dwell on this long, but be careful how you understand even that phrase, as there are certainly things that, that, that God's character, his nature, and his attributes prohibit him from doing. For example, we know that God cannot lie, he cannot sin, he cannot change, and he cannot break a promise. What Jesus is getting at when he says all things are possible for you is an acknowledgement to who God is with respect to his sovereignty and to him being all-powerful, as well as the direct connection back to the previous verse where Jesus is essentially questioning whether or not a possibility existed. Was there a possibility that existed whereby this hour might indeed pass from him and with this confidence and supreme assurance in what God was capable of here in verse 36 if possible Jesus requests that his all-powerful daddy would remove this cup from him the cup being symbolic for the contents which in this situation contains not only the bitterness and grief associated with the suffering the humiliation and death that he is about to be subjected to, but also to the wrath of God's judgment that he will take upon himself as a result of our sin. But Jesus quickly follows this request up with the forceful statement, yes, not what I will, but what you will. Or as we more perhaps commonly refer to it, let not my will be done, but yours. It is important for us to remember here that Jesus isn't asking for God to do anything that he shouldn't or doesn't want to do. That Jesus firmly and completely understands that God's will is perfect and just. In fact, throughout his ministry, Jesus made it perfectly clear. That not only were he and the Father one, but that they were one in will and one in purpose, as he always submitted to the will of the Father. This is how Jesus said it in John chapter 5, verse 30. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Everything that Jesus did, including any judgments that he may have offered, were not his own seeking to establish his own will. He always did the will of the one who sent him, his father, his daddy. That's one of the reasons that he spent so much time in prayer. So that in his incarnate state, being both fully human and fully God, that he would remain one in spirit, one in purpose, one in will with the father. His example here is so important to us. Even though he was God in the flesh, he still needed, he still needed to be in communion with the Father. How much more? How much more then do we, who are 100% human and 0% God, how much more then do we need to be in constant prayer with God, listening Listening for that still, small voice, submitting and surrendering to the will of our daddy, who loves us, who values us, who wants to protect us, wants to bless us, wants to grow us. John goes on in his gospel to record more on the oneness of Jesus and the will, and the will of the Father, as we read in John chapter 6, verses 38 through 40. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will but, but will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on that last day. Jesus always did the Father's will. They were always one in purpose, one in spirit, one in action and direction. In fact, even the cup, 
that Jesus was about to drink had been known and agreed to by both of them long before Jesus ever took on flesh, long before sin entered the world, long before anything but God alone existed. So if that's the case, why the prayer? Why does Jesus even ask that this hour might pass without him having to drink then from this cup? It certainly wasn't because he was powerless, that he was alone, that God had abandoned him. On the contrary, he was God in the flesh and could have used the power at any time. In fact, later on, when Judas does come with the crowd and the temple guards to arrest Jesus, Matthew describes how Peter takes a sword and cuts off the ear of one of the servants of the high priest. Jesus then rebukes Peter, telling him to put his sword away, and then reminds Peter... Of, this, of his power saying, do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? Even at that time, Peter didn't get what was happening. And that what was happening was exactly what Jesus had said must happen and exactly what Isaiah prophesied would happen. Again, Isaiah 53, 10 through 11. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He was put to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Why did Jesus ask that this hour might pass without him having to drink this cup? Because in his humanity, he really did suffer. Yes, in his deity, he knew what needed to be done and why it needed to be done. But in his, in his humanity, it was still going to be intense suffering. So intense that we can't even begin to comprehend it. In his humanity, just like you and me and the 11 men who were with him in the Garden of Gethsemane that day, he really did fear death. And he knew that these 11 men would also be called to suffer greatly even to the point of their own death. And although he agonized over death in his humanity, equally in his humanity, he chose to pray. He chose to submit. He chose to surrender. He chose to do the will of his daddy. Why? Because he loves us. You, me, and all who faithfully and sincerely put their faith and trust in him in his daddy, in his plans, in his wisdom, and in his will. He proved that his daddy could be trusted. And we thank God not only for his willingness to do so, but for the precious gift of salvation that he bought for us by his very blood. The blood that washes away our sin, the blood that brings forgiveness and reconciliation, the blood that he spilt through his death that we now look to for the victory over death that he bought for us. And all because when it came right down to it, to the appointed hour, when the bitterness of the cup was prepared and ready for him to drink, even in the fear of his human flesh, he chose to be obedient. He chose to trust his daddy. He chose to do his will, and God resurrected and exalted him, that in time, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess the glorious name of Jesus, our Lord, our King, and our Savior. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you today humbled humbled by
this enormous sacrifice that you made on our behalf. Taking upon f flesh, becoming 100% human and 100% God at the same time, you suffered and were tempted in every way in which we did. And in the face of something that we can't even possibly begin to imagine, the fear of death in your humanity rose, just as it rises for each of us at various times in our lives. And in that moment, acknowledging the plan, acknowledging who you are and who God was, the power that he had, if there could have been a way, another way, might he have chosen that way instead, such that you would not have had to have gone through the passion the suffering that you were about to go through. But yet, but yet, not your will, but his will is what you chose and did. Lord, we thank you for your perfect obedience as it serves as a model for us as we are also 100% man and 0% God knowing that we can put all of our trust in your daddy, our daddy as well. That by your blood, we are saved, forgiven and reconciled. We cannot thank you enough. We love you, but you loved us first. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.